Well, a very warm welcome to you all to our Wild Christian Campaign Takeaway. We are so incredibly excited to have with us this evening Richard Benwell, who is the CEO of the Wildlife and Countryside Link, and he will be speaking to us about the Nature 2030 campaign. My name is Hannah and I'm the policy officer here at Arusha UK. And for those of you who might not know us, we are a Christian conservation charity working to protect and restore nature in the UK. Wild Christian is our programme exploring the connections between faith, the natural world and how we live. Talking about taking practical action for the planet at home and joining with others to advocate for nature. Sometimes caring for God's creation can feel quite lonely. We often meet and speak with Christians who feel like they're the only ones within their congregations or family who care about these issues. So in, at Wild Christian, we really want to offer opportunities to connect people with others who are passionate about caring for creation and provide a space where we can cheer each other on um, when we're feeling especially disheartened and celebrate our wins together too. We do this through our regular campaign takeaway events where we take an in-depth look at campaigns which advocate for nature, like the one you'll be hearing about tonight. And we think together about how we, as Christians and the church, can raise our voice for the protection and restoration of the natural world. This is really important to us because the church has a very important role to play as part of civil society in calling for action to protect creation. We know that the UK is one of the most nature depleted parts of the world, and we lament that loss of species and habitats that we've already seen. We believe that it is absolutely essential that policies, therefore don't, policymakers therefore don't see nature as something that is just nice to have, but as foundational for human well-being, a thriving economy, as well as absolutely critical in the fight against climate change. And that is why we are so excited to be backing the Nature 2030 campaign, which calls for nature to be put at the heart of policy in the lead up to the next general election. It's a coalition campaign convened by Wildlife and Countryside Link, and backed by a huge group of organisations, including names you'll know like the RSPB, Wildlife Trust, National Trust, and many more. We've been a member of that coalition um, for over five years now, and so we are really excited to be part of this incredibly timely campaign. So without much further ado, I would love to just introduce our guest speaker. Richard Benwell is the Chief Executive of Wildlife and Countryside Link, which is a coalition, as I've said, of 78 nature charities. He's also the chair of Oxfordshire Local Nature Partnership, a trustee of UK Youth for Nature, and a director of the Broadway Initiative. Previously, Richard was policy advisor to the Secretary of State at DEFRA, has worked at the RSPB, Wildfall and Wetlands Trust, the Home Affairs Select Committee, and the Energy and Climate Change Committee, Climate Change Select Committee, as well as being a board member for West Mills Solar Cooperative. So with a CV like that, we are absolutely delighted to have Richard with us this, this evening. And I'll just pass right over to Richard to tell us about your campaign. Thank you so much, Hannah, and thanks to the Arosha gang for inviting me this evening. And uh, great to see everybody. Thank you for coming along. Uh, it's excellent to be part of a, an environmental campaigns evening. And when you when you say to folk, uh, I'm off to talk about environmental campaigns, what do they think of? Well. Some people in this last couple of weeks, they might think of the debacle around nutrient neutrality, where the government suggested that it would strip away the laws that protect our rivers from additional sewage pollution, additional nutrient pollution coming from new housing developments. Those laws, which came from the EU originally, were there to make sure that for our most sensitive wildlife habitats, new developments aren't allowed unless they offset the extra pollution load they'll cause. And stripping away those laws would have been the worst regression of environmental law for decades. So we defeated the government on that. It was fantastic. And there was an amazing campaign of righteous outrage at what the government was proposing. So you might think of that. Or you might think back to last year when uh, there was the attack on nature moment, when many of those organizations that you'll know and love that uh, are, are normal, normally quiet and calm, conservative and modest in their approach, like the RSPB, suddenly spoke out more stridently than they have for a very long time in response to the government's proposals to um, rip up 
uh, the remainder of EU retained law, which accounts for a huge amount of our environmental statute book. Again, a campaign characterized by really a collective moment of fury from the environmental community in seeing what was going on. Or you might think, of course, of the campaign at the moment to end sewage pollution or air pollution. These are all absolutely tremendously important environmental campaigns. What do they all have in common? Well, they're trying to stop bad things from happening, aren't they? They're all campaigns to prevent additional harm to our natural environment. They're all campaigns to stave off something worse that the government is doing or to end some injustice. Those are all really, really important, but they don't really do anything to turn around the basic state of nature in our country, which sadly is one of long-term chronic decline. Hannah's already mentioned that we live in one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. And that story of decline is one that's been charted over 150 years since the industrial revolution. And the numbers really are terrifying. Since 1970, the priority species index, so our index of our most important and uh, most vulnerable species has declined from 100 in 1970 to just 37 now, uh, reaching about half uh, in the year I was born in 1983. So it really has been a, a, a precipitous decline. And even with all the promises that we've been given over the last 10 years to have the world's most ambitious environmental programme, that's what the, uh, the Conservative Manifesto said, even with that promise to be the first generation to turn around the decline in the state of nature, sadly, we see no evidence that that decline in the abundance on and distribution of species is actually going to turn around. In a couple of weeks time, the next state of nature report will be launched and I, I won't give detailed spoilers, but guess what? It's not happy reading for nature. So I didn't want to bombard you with gloom to begin. Uh, that, that's all by way of saying uh, the public is brilliant at responding to campaigns to stave off harm. People are absolutely willing to pile in when they see those terrible uh, examples of um, a worsening situation for nature. But what we're much less adept at is campaigning for positive systemic change that will be needed to create the sort of nature positive economy that actually stands a chance of turning around that decline in the abundance of nature. One of the really good things that's happened over the last couple of parliaments has been the passage of the Environment Act. It's not perfect by any means, but it did do a couple of really important things. And chief among them, perhaps, is setting the world's first legally binding target to halt the decline of species abundance in England. It wasn't in the bill to begin with, but along with A-Russia and with many other organisations in LINK, we campaigned for that target. We learned the lessons of the Climate Change Act, that if you really want to change things in government, you need a statutory hook enforced by law to force government, a, a crowbar for action to turn things around. And the Environment Act has begun to set that for nature. So it has set in law a target to halt and begin to reverse the decline in species abundance by 2030. Say that to a, a policymaker, and gosh, well, um, I think I think it's something that uh, that many are in a state of denial about at the moment. Because when you think about it, that's just seven years away. It's at the end of the very next Parliament that will be expected to meet that legally binding target. So the question that we set ourselves with the Nature 2030 campaign is if you really do want to achieve that goal of stopping the decline of nature, how do we go beyond reactive campaigning to fend off bad things and start creating a radical but realistic platform for change that goes beyond the sort of normal run of manifestos that says, I'll plant 20,000 trees, I'll plant 40,000, no, I'll do it faster. We needed to talk instead about the sort of real system level changes that will help us to turn around the decline in biodiversity. And frankly, there's not a corner of our economy that can go unchanged if we're serious about meeting those targets. 
So it's fantastic that we've got 100 organisations now behind the Nature 2030 campaign. And rather than the normal thing of running into the approach to a general election as a nature sector, where we either default to say, be nice to nature, or we come in with a shopping list of a million squillion things that we want parliamentarians to do that they can then just cherry pick from and do none. We've come to five proposals that we think are needed to create the foundation for turning around that decline in species abundance. So what are they? Well, they cover uh, food and farming. They cover private investment in nature. They cover land use and sea use change, green jobs and environmental rights. They're the five basic buckets. Farming, private action, land and sea use, green jobs, environmental rights. Uh, and I'll give you a quick spin through, if I may, what we're talking about in each of those areas. And I hope you'll agree that what we're asking for is pretty brave, but it's not out with the bounds of possibility. And it's definitely proportionate to the scale of the challenge for turning around that decline in species abundance. So the first, food and farming. Well, hey, uh, some parliamentarians will say to you, don't worry about it, we've got it sorted. We spend two and a bit billion pounds a year on farming in England, and we're transitioning to a new scheme called environmental land management, where we're going to pay for public, public money for public goods to help farmers transition to greener farming. Why is it important? Well, it's 70% of our country is covered by farmland. And the farmland bird index is one of those real sort of bellwether indices of decline that shows just how much the intensification of farming has harmed uh, some of those species that you'll know and love. So corn bunting, skylarks, um, uh, uh, house sparrows, tree sparrows, all of the uh, yellow hammers, all of those sort of farmland, uh, farmland bird specialists have been in decline. Turning around the farmed environment is fundamental for turning around the fate of biodiversity more broadly. The government's proposals are good in so far as we agree they should be spending public money on public goods. But so far, what we've seen is essentially a reinvention of the system that we had in the European Union, where we paid people for uh, owning land. Now we're calling it something different. We're calling it the sustainable farming incentive, but really the level of additional effort that's being asked of farmers and land managers isn't the step up that we need. And that's why at LINK we think we need not only to increase the level of ambition for environmental land management so that it can support those farmers who want to go further and faster to regenerate their soils, to build in habitats across their farms, to reduce their dependence on, uh, on fertilizer and on pesticides. But we also want to see a situation where those actions are rewarded properly. At the moment, the government pays for it on the basis of income foregone. So it pays basically the cost of the action. We think it deserves far more. So we're calling for a doubling of investment in environmental land management so that farmers can be paid properly to reflect the massive, essentially industrial transition we're asking of them over the next few years. But of course, we can't rely on the public first to do this. We need private sector action as well. And there, Gosh, I mentioned nutrient neutrality earlier. The clue is in the name. All we ask those corporations to do is make good on the additional harm that they're going to cause through their pursuit for profits. And the same is true of biodiversity net gain, which is the other major new market innovation. There's almost nothing by way of re regulatory requirements to require companies in major polluting sectors to actively invest in nature's recovery. So that's what we're calling for, a nature recovery obligation that doesn't just ask them to offset harm, but expects major polluting sectors, finance, development, water, agri-food, not just to offset their harm, but to invest in nature's recovery. And that's the kind of driver that we saw from the Climate Change Act that got big businesses investing in net zero. We need the same for a nature positive economy. I promise not to spend as long on all of them, so I shall squeeze through the last three. The third is 30 by 30, so the government promised to protect 30% of land and sea for nature by 2030. We are three years in. We think they've so far protected about 3% of the land and 8% of the sea. 
So we think a rapid investment programme is needed to protect more places for nature. And we've also got what we hope is an exciting idea of a, a new public nature estate. So maximising the idea of the public forest estate, but making sure that public land works well for nature. Fourth is the idea of a national nature service, a green jobs programme to help young people who want to be part of uh, nature recovery to get those skills in ecology, in uh, hedgerow and woodland management, in um, regenerative farming skills that they need to become part of this new economy. And we think there should be a paid for in job uh, recruitment so job service to help people to be part of that future. And fifth and finally, we're talking about environmental rights. It's something that divides opinion in this strange culture wars society we're in now to talk about rights. Some people think it's woke. Some people think it's an artifice of the left designed to snarl up courts. Well, at Link, we think everybody should have the right to breathe clean air that meets good public health standards. We think everybody should have the right to clean water that's unpolluted. And we think that everybody should have the right to access a healthy natural environment within a reasonable walking distance of home. Doing this is a huge social justice issue. 40,000 people die prematurely of air pollution every year in the UK. A third of us, according to the government's own numbers, don't have access to a healthy natural environment within 15 minutes walk of home. And that, of course, contributes to all the problems of chronic ill health, like um, mental health uh, issues and like obesity and heart disease that we're suffering more and more as a society. So our fifth suggestion to government is that basic environmental standards should be rights that everybody enjoy. And that's the package. It sounds it sounds bold, I hope. It sounds like the sort of thing that um, uh, requires visionary politicians to get behind it. And we hope that it's the sort of thing that nevertheless is achievable within the next parliament. So we hope you'll join us. We hope you'll join us in uh, the campaign action, which is an open letter to party leaders, asking them to include these suggestions within their manifestos for the next parliament. We think it's time to stop focusing campaigning purely on fending off harm. Of course, we must continue to do that, but it's time to set out on the page more clearly than ever before the kinds of systemic societal change that we need if we're seriously going to turn around the decline in the state of nature. It'd be wonderful to work together on it. Thank you so much, Richard, for your amazing talk. And we are, we are so excited to work together with you and the rest of Link on this. Um, I'm now actually just going to hand over to Regina Ebner, who is going to um, speak a little bit about our response as an organisation to this um, campaign. Just Regina is our Partner in Action Coordinator, um, which means that she looks after our huge network of Christian land managers and landowners that are doing really amazing things on their land for nature. So, Regina. Thank you, Hannah. So yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you, Richard, for joining us today and being able to share about the nature campaign um, with us. And so the campaign is very close to the hearts and minds of many of our partners in action. Um, as you, most of you probably know, the network of 44 partners, which are landowners and land managers, they come from all kinds of walks of life from farming community right the way through to hotels, conference centers, forest schools, um, outdoor activity centers, cathedrals, and more. Um, increasingly, we are actually also connecting with the farming community at scale. And for many years, these partners have been pushing for more funding um, for conservation measures. And we are really grateful, therefore, that one of the key asks of the 2030 campaign is that farmers have their support doubled to ensure that they can deliver nature-friendly farming. And we are already beginning to see the results of this with the Sustainable Farming Initiative, but this is just the beginning. Another area of development for us is our first venture into landscape scale projects, which will restore um, some of the Atlantic rainforest in West Scotland. 
And this links really well with another objective of the campaign, which is making more space for nature, restoring protected sites and landscapes by 2030. And finally, many of our smaller and more community-based projects um, will be really excited to learn that the 2030 campaign wishes to establish a right to healthy environments as a human right. This is especially relevant for urban and inner city projects where access to green spaces um, is critical to the physical and mental well-being for all ages. Um, our eco-church network already has access to over six and a half thousand churches in, in England and Wales. Um, there is no doubt in our minds that the church network that is fully activated and engaged with the 2030 campaign can have a positive impact through making more space for nature. Even if some of in some of the instances, the amount of land that each site has is quite small, collect the collective capacity of the church to reach large areas and aid nature's recovery is clearly really significant. Um, over the next few years, we are planning to more than double the network of churches who we are engaging with. And at the same time, we are going to continue to build our Partners in Action Network. These two programs alone can play a really significant part in helping wildlife and countryside link to deliver on key demands. Um, it is no secret that we need nature and no surprise that if we don't increase the scale and speed of our actions, nature will continue to decline in much the same way as it has done over the past um, 25 years or so. So we would really commend this campaign as exactly what we need at this time. And our Russia UK will continue to encourage our partners and supporters to add their voice to this wider civil society call for action in this critical year in advance of the next um, general election. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regina. And I know for myself, it's just so wonderful to hear about how this campaign is going to connect with the people in our networks who are out there on the ground in churches kind of making making a difference for nature so thank you so much for that Regina. So we're now going to move into a time of questions for um, Richard and I've seen already some really fantastic ones in the chat but I think I'm going to start us off one with one which I hope will be a bit fun for you Richard which is just what sparked this lifelong interest in nature or this commitment to for your work what where did you get your passion for nature from? That is a good question. Well, um, it's hard, it's hard to know where where things really began when you look back to what happened in your childhood, isn't it? And we all tell ourselves stories about where things came from. The, the, I guess I, I I have two two things I, I remember most fondly. The first is my, my granddad telling me about red kites, um, how wonderful they were. Um, he he was a butcher, uh, and he used to uh, look after cattle uh, over on the Welsh borders and occasionally saw, saw kites and uh, the reintroduction filled him with excitement. So that was one thing. The second was I went to a wonderful school where boys were allowed to go bird watching for their Friday afternoon activity. I mean, what kind of a madness is that? But every afternoon I got my binoculars, I went down to a, a lake in the centre of Birmingham and I counted uh, ruddy ducks there wouldn't be any more of those any, anymore and shovelers and gulls and it was wonderful um so uh yes as as i'm sure many of us have ended up uh in in whatever walk of life we're in because of an inspiring teacher uh, i was lucky to have a, a little oasis in the center of birmingham i was the only boy on the option at one point uh and, and yet they allowed it to continue that sounds idyllic. I think Jen wants to know which school this was, because we all <laughs> wish that we could have had that opportunity. It sounds fantastic. Well, um, so, sorry, go King ahead. Edward's in Birmingham. It was a very <laughs> lovely place to be. And uh, I've just spotted that one of uh, the, the, the mums of somebody I went to school with is, in fact, in the audience. So hi, Jane. Very <laughs> good to see you. Fantastic. Um, now into something a little bit... Um, less fun, but, but very serious. Looking at... Um, so but you're talking about the big polluters and there's been two questions here and there's one from Andrew which is about ex if you could expand on why finance is a big polluter and then maybe if you to take another one at the same time about 
you know, you listed some big polluter industries earlier, finance, development, and there, there was one more and someone, um, Xana, was just asking for a bit more, if you could just repeat that part. So could you take those two questions together and talk a bit about those big polluters and, and their contribution? Yeah, sure. I mean, we don't want to be too sort of prescriptive about w which sectors must be covered or not, but the ones that I typically would would list are um, development, so, you know, housing and infrastructure development, um, agri-food, so um, quite where you would levy the, the um, requirements might be on the retailers, it might be on the food processors, probably not on the farmers, you've already got plenty to think about, uh, uh, water, um, finance uh, uh, uh so those those type of sectors that have a big uh, impact on on land take why mm -hmm. finance well because uh, of course where investments go drives a lot of uh, a lot of damage and we've seen in the climate space um a push to have better disclosure uh, about um supply chain impacts uh, and about where big finance are putting their money to move away from fossil fuels to greener investments can have a huge uh, a huge impact. So that one's really about leveraging effects through the supply chain, uh, ideally internationally, but probably uh, at least to begin with uh, domestically. And the point is that at the moment, those businesses are free riding off our natural environment. We still live in an extractive economy where the costs that come from taking more from nature don't fall on the businesses who profit from them they fall on you and me they fall on the natural environment and they fall on future generations so this is about not this isn't some sort of um anti-capitalist mantra this is about um using markets properly and internalizing the costs of damage creating market incentives so that the most profitable businesses are the greenest businesses rather than those who free ride most readily on on the state on our environment fantastic thank you um and we've had a couple of questions about farming so i'm gonna i'm gonna put two together again if you don't mind the first is from colin one of our one of our trustees he's on the call he's asked how much of a pay rise for nature could be funded by stopping paying subsidies for action that damage nature <laughs> and the second question is from stuart which is about um, farmer groups such as the Farmers Union, are they supporting the campaign? What's kind of been the interaction with the farming community and, and those groups on this? Really good questions. I mean, you're absolutely right, Colin. The first thing to do is to stop paying for daft stuff. Uh, and um, luckily, we no longer live in the sort of age of subsidy for um, volume of production. So we don't have quite the situation of those old mountains of butter and lakes of wine or whatever it was. But we do still pay for um, uh, activities that are, can be very harmful. I mean, there's been this case recently, hasn't there, about Dartmoor, where um, people were enjoying subsidies that were supposedly for environmental benefit, but have helped to lead to overstocking and overgrazing uh, and uh, to intensive activities on that protected landscape. So, yes, absolutely stopping subsidies that do harm and removing payments that add no benefit are the first and most important things to do for value for money. Um, hopefully you get a long way then to freeing up funds to do good, but uh, some, of, some of our members have done some analysis of the costs that it would take to meet the government's own nature targets. And even without taking into account things like animal welfare and access to nature, or water quality, the, the number that RSPB, Wildlife Trust and National Trust came to was £4.3 billion a year. We think if you include those wider goods and if you include the urgency of this matter uh, uh, and the fact that you'll never have a perfect system, there is a really strong case for more like £6 billion a year. And just to put that in context, in case you're in any doubt, Probably somebody will know this better on the call than me, but over the last decade or so, the amount we spend on roads a year has varied between about 14 billion and 20 billion pounds a year. So to me, spending a little bit more on something that comprises 70% of our land or a huge amount of our green infrastructure, surely the case stacks up compared with, uh, with that kind of budget for roads and developed infrastructure. The second question about farmers, sorry, um, I'm, I'm talking too long, probably. 
uh, it, really good question. Um, some farming groups have already lent their support. So the brilliant Nature Friendly Farming Network has signed up to the Nature 2030 campaign. If you haven't looked up the Nature Friendly Farming Network, please do, because they are a bunch of the coolest, greenest farmers you'll ever find who are running profitable businesses uh, without, um, you know, it's not some, uh, it's not, not small scale operations, they're serious big businesses and they're doing it in a way that works with nature. Uh, the NFU have not yet signed up, but um, I hope that they may yet pay, pay uh, a bit closer attention to the campaign and that they will see that we're basically on the same side, which is to create a profitable future for farming that is also sustainable. Absolutely. It would be absolutely critical, I think, to take the farming sector along. So this is really exciting to see that up and, and foremost on your list. Uh, we've got a couple of questions now about um, engaging politicians. And there's there's one from Andy, our CEO, who's also on the call, about what response you've had from the political parties um, about the campaign asks. Um, yeah, and have any of them agreed to include these five campaign asks in their manifestos? What, what's that looking like at the, this time? Good question, Andy. Well, I'm pleased to say that a week ago, I would have been talking about two other aspects of the campaign, which we've now won, in fact. So um, part of the, the, the 30 by 30 bit was about making sure that planning works better for nature. And in particular, national parks and AONBs should work better for nature at the moment. Nature tends to be in worse condition in those sites than it is outside. And we, we won a change to the law in the levelling up bill that will require in future uh, public bodies to contribute to nature management plans in national parks and AONBs. So that was a good step forward. I can't say that we did it with the government's um, uh, willing uh, um, participation, but Lord Randall, a Conservative MP, tabled the amendment and eventually with cross-party support, the government um, conceded. So the government did accept it in the end. So that's really good. Uh, and we also won a stronger legal link for local nature recovery strategies and the planning system, which Lady Parmenter, a Lib Dem, tabled with support of the Labour Party. So some progress already on the things we were asking for. As for the manifestos, well, I, I'm sure you'll appreciate that I can't sort of tell you about all of the private conversations that we've had so far with the parties. But I think at the moment, there is still an eye opening necessary to help um, more to help all of the parties, potentially with the exception of one, to realise uh, just just what a big effort will be needed if they're serious about these targets. But we have had really constructive um, conversations with a couple of parties already. I'm hopeful that if we can keep up the momentum of the campaign, we might see some serious commitments on the page. Uh, the only one that has sort of gone public so far is the Lib Dems will have a new environment paper at their conference this very weekend that includes um, the idea of a right to nature um, if they were to get into government. But we have also had really constructive conversations with the Labour Party and with with um, with Conservatives and Greens as well. So there's hope. We need to keep up momentum. And if everyone writes their local MP and say, this is what we really want to see in your manifesto, maybe that will help a little bit too, I think. Um, we've got another question and I, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, just, sorry, go on, go on. Sorry, Hannah, sorry to interrupt. I promise you, only brief, but one of, one of the things that always vexes me is that politicians get away with just saying they'll be nice to nature on the doorstep. Mm -hmm. And that's why the specificity here is really important because no politician will turn up on your doorstep and say, oh, I'm fine with sewage pollution, will they? They'll all go, I like birds, uh, please vote for me. So the test for people on the doorstep is, are you going to commit the money? Are you going to do the regulations? Are you going to change the land management? Are you going to give us rights? Are you going to have green jobs? And that makes it specific enough so that you'll tell the, gr the greenwashing, uh, I love birds, honest uh, versus versus the ones who are serious. Yeah, that really, yeah, good advice. Don't let them get away with it. Really go for it. <laughs> In a Christian way, gently encourage them. Um, we've got another question here and the boy kind of how um from from our colleague Geffen 
about how we what do we do if we're not from England if we're from Northern Ireland like myself or Wales or Scotland how do we um, are there templates for us to use to avoid being asked for the same things like how, how do we kind of engage our politicians when this is a lot of this is a devolved matter in some cases so any advice yeah really good question the world is getting more complex in that way isn't it but hopefully also uh, creates space for a race to the top although one of the things we're finding frustrating at the moment is the internal markets act which doesn't allow um, as much flexibility for the four countries to go beyond Westminster than we'd like so want to watch out for colleagues in other countries um, but the the Nature 2030 campaign is for the UK general election so we are asking people to sign up wherever they live in the UK because you'll be voting for your representative in Westminster um, but there will be similar uh, there will be uh, similar campaign actions coming in response to um, uh, well there'll be some more campaign actions coming that have a four country uh, um, version over the next few weeks that are very closely related to state of nature uh, and give the sort of four country versions so look out for those at the end of this month Fantastic. And I think we have time um, for just one more. And there's one here about um, the climate crisis and tackling fossil fuels. And I'm interested to know, I know this is a campaign that's specifically about um, nature, but have, is, is there anything you can tell us about how climate factors into this and into this proposals and, and where you see kind of joined up thinking um, on that? Yeah, I mean, we are absolutely as much a climate charity as we are a nature charity. And um, in, in my book, you should never say one without the other. So um, in some ways, the, the climate conversation is more advanced. So we know more of what we need to do. And that's why we're really focused on nature here. But it's worth remembering that there is literally no prospect of achieving net zero without ch changing the future of nature. The the net bit in net zero comes from sequestering carbon, but uh, uh, that's, that's still being emitted so that we can actually get to that situation of netting off and being below zero. And at the moment, there are only a couple of ways to do that. The first is to rely on an unproven technology called carbon capture and storage, which we hope will work, uh, but still has massive questions around its deployment at scale. The other, is to sequester carbon in nature. At the moment, the UK is a net emitter of emissions from land use. So we're still releasing more carbon from our land than we're sequestering, mostly because of things like peat burning, which is just daft and we should stop it. Um, but if we're going to get to net zero, we need to have more habitats from trees to meadows to wetlands in good condition, sucking down that carbon to help us to reach net zero. Um, and uh, it's, it also goes without saying that, that decarbonisation and progress on climate change is, is an absolute must for, for nature recovery. I mean, we've, how many of us kind of not noticed the changing seasons and the different times of insects emerging and changing migration patterns uh, from familiar species over the last few years? Things are changing and, and climate is, of course, a, a huge pressure and uh, accelerator on on harm to nature so they're utterly wrapped up i could not agree more very excellently put thank you richard um there's just one more i'm going to squeeze in before we move on to the campaign action and it's from andrew and he's just asked if the list drops from 100 percent in 1970 to 50 percent in about 1987 the rate of decline is clearly slowing is this a hopeful sign do you want no. to speak to the question uh, well, uh, I wish I had the charts in front of me. I may have been being uh, slightly um, uh, take, taken some poetic license about saying exactly where we were when I was born. Uh, I was mainly trying to express the, the, the curve has been going down a long time. I think the numbers, you can check them on because they're the government's own numbers. I think that the numbers are that we are now, as of 2021, the index was at 37%. And I think the OEP, which is the Office for Environmental Protection, has reported recently that the that the we've seen about a two percent decline in that index, uh, which hasn't reduced over an extended period. So 
uh, I can't tell you exactly how long that sort of two two percent per year has been going on, but their assessment is that decline is still locked in, and there is as yet no sign that we are bending the curve towards recovery. So if I was a little bit um, uh, liberal or lyrical with my exact years, it was to express the fact that um, even in my lifetime, uh, things have been going down. Of course, in some areas that there, there, there is recovery. Um, you know, we've managed to do some really positive things in some areas. Think of reintroductions. Um, some some species have been pulled back from the brink. The bittern, you know, we can see everywhere. I talked about red kites before. Uh, and of course, some species that are establishing themselves that are wonderful to see. Uh, uh, little egrets are, you know, commonplace now and they're just wonderful. So there's good stuff happening. But overall, the trend remains downwards. And the last State of Nature report, I think the numbers were 15% of species at risk of extinction in the UK and 46% uh, in long term decline. So, uh, Forgive me for being a bit evening headed, but those are the, the, the numbers, I think. Thank you so much. And I think it, I think it's really wonderful actually to end on a, a note of kind of, of of hopefulness that in the midst of some of the ways we lament species loss and habitat loss, there are still little things to celebrate as well. There have been some signs um, as well as as a general trend towards the clients. So I think that's that's a good and I think it's as, as sort of campaigners, there will be always a bit of that, isn't there? You know, there a bit of. Um, Whilst we want to fight back, there will be bits of celebration in there too. So thank you so much, Richard. I'm just going to take thank us on now. Thank you. I'm going to take us on now to our campaign action, our live campaign action. So um, we're going to be stopping the recording, but to anybody catching up later, don't forget to sign up to Wild Christian at arosha.org.uk slash wildchristian to hear about our future events and to add your name to the petition, which you will be able to find at, on our website.